to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the bible says in first corinthians 7 verse 35 serve the lord without distraction. We welcome you today to our study of the book of First Corinthians. We want to encourage you to fi find your Bible and have that handy as we're going to be looking to First Corinthians chapter 7 and 8 in our study of questions about marriage and things that are optional that might offend somebody's conscience. And what should a Christian do in situations like these? And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study to get together today. I uh, want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregate members and congregations of the Churches of Christ, the Lord's Church in your area. Would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, they'd be happy to have you. You'd be an honored guest. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who would be happy to sit down and open up the scriptures with you if that would be your desire. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we're also concerned about people's souls. That's what we're all about at the Gospel of Christ. We're concerned about nothing more than people going to heaven. And friend, if we can help you in your journey to know God and His Word better, we'd love to do that. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From it, you will find a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have video lessons, audio lessons, study questions, transcripts, just a host of good material that will aid you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, you can download that to your computer or smartphone free of charge, or we could send you a DVD or CD upon your request as well. Just go to our website, The Gospel of Christ, fill out our media request form, We'll put that in the mail to you free of charge. Friend, as we think today about marriage and about things that might bother people's conscience in 1 Corinthians 7 and 8, we've got to realize that marriage is indeed a very serious issue, and it's an issue that comes under attack by Satan and by the world outside. And so some of the Christians in Corinth are struggling, seems like, with some questions about marriage. And so Paul will say in verse number one, now concerning the things you wrote to me, and then he'll address those issues. They had evidently sent Paul some questions about marriage and things relating to divorce and remarriage and things like that. And so Paul is going to try to address that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's the answer to their questions. Now, to apply these teachings, we need to try our best to understand the question and the context. And so in verses 1 and 2, uh, the question seems to be, would it be, is it okay uh, to marry? Is, is it better to stay celibate and single, or can a person uh, marry is kind of the idea. And so Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, let each woman have her own husband. Should we even marry? Is it better to stay single? What should a Christian do? And friend, you've got to realize some of this is, um, some of this is guided by what's going on in their historical context. And that's found in verse number 26. Paul will say, concerning the present distress, if you could stay single like me, stay single almost, he'll say. And so there was a lot of persecution. The church was facing all kind of, of problems from without, and we know from within as well, and so there was a certain amount of persecution. And some of what he will say is related to that as well. And so Paul will say, if you can refrain, then that's fine. But if you want to marry, that's fine too. Uh, so he says in verse 2, there are some guidelines that go along with that if you choose to do that, and that is each husband is to have his own wife, each wife is to have her own husband. It is not okay to have somebody else's wife. 
It is not okay to have multiple wives. Paul says each man and woman are to have their own husband and wife. That's God's plan as it relates to marriage. And then, of course, he will say, if you do decide to marry, please realize also there are responsibilities that you have towards your partner that you agree to by marrying. Now, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about uh, the physical relationship that does exist as well. Look at what is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. To those who are of mature understanding of this, those who are able to see what Paul is saying about as it relates to marriage and the physical relationship, there's responsibilities. It's a part of marriage. It's the, the designed way to fulfill Lust and desires which are given by God and in an approved way are good and right and holy. Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. And so we have responsibility to one another in that area so that Satan doesn't tempt us if we don't fulfill those. And so there is a certain sense in which I need to think about my spouse. I need to think about her desires as well. And we need to think about helping one another with the temptations that may arise and to be understanding of that. And so, is marriage wrong? No. Is it wrong to be single? No. But if you decide to marry, have your own wife and husband. Uh, make sure that you fulfill uh, what God has set forth within marriage to help one another in those areas and stay true to one another. And then Paul will address what about uh, Christians who are married. What should Christians who are married do in times like these? Well, look in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. What's God's? This is basically the Lord's plan on marriage that we've seen throughout the Bible. Two people are married. What should they do? Stay together. The Lord says in Matthew 19, 9, that they're not to divorce except for fornication. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Matthew 19, uh, 6, Mark chapter 10, Luke 16, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Don't depart and divorce one another. That's what Paul will say clearly in this text. Don't divorce. That's not God's plan for marriage. That's not what He wants. Two people. Listen to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two will come, become one flesh. God saw there was not good for man to be alone. Therefore, he made him a helper comparable to him. Genesis 2, verse 18. And so, we want to stay together, help one another, make marriage last for life. That's what Christians ought to do. Well, what, what if somebody does leave or try to? You know, what if they decide, Paul says, you need to remain single or be reconciled to each other. It's not God's plan that you divorce. That's not what He wants. Well, what about then in a situation where you've got Christian, non-Christian in a marriage? What about when you've got a Christian and a uh, non-believer? And friend, this is why we always caution uh, Christians to marry Christians. But you can imagine the scenario here. The gospel comes to Corinth. Two people are already married. They hear the gospel. One of them obeys it. One of them doesn't. So you've got a Christian, non-Christian there. No doubt there's an unequal yoke, but what do you do in a situation like that? Should you just up and leave them? No. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12 following. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And so what's Paul's basic message? If you've got a non-Christian mate, you don't need to up and divorce them. Why? God's blessings and sanctifications may come upon that individual and the children for the Christian who's in that home. That's what verse 14 is teaching, that they be sanctified for the case of the Christian. 
Well, what then about verse 15? Oftentimes there's a lot of, of confusion on this. What is Paul saying? Listen to verse 15. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Is, is Paul saying here that if you've got a Christian, non-Christian married, and the unbeliever says, that's it, I'm done, that you can just go who marry whoever you want? No. What's he saying? You're not so bound to that non-Christian by the marriage bond uh, that you've got to leave Christ and follow them. Here, here's the illustration of that. As we said, the gospel comes to two people. Neither one of them are Christians. One of them obeys the gospel, one of them doesn't. You can imagine that would drastically change everybody's life. And the person who's not a Christian, it's really changed their life. And they may not like it. They don't go out and party like they used to. They're not involved in idolatry anymore. It, the marriage is just not as fun in their opinion. And so one day, they come home, they slam the marriage paper down, and they say, it's either me or Christianity. You decide. What's Paul saying? You're not under bondage to, in such an extreme way to say, well, okay, I guess I'll leave Christ for you. No, I'm not, that's not, the, that's not the, what Paul's talking about there. What he's saying is, you're not under bondage to leave, that, leave Christ and follow that person. Is he saying you're free to remarry? That's not the idea of what's being taught here. And Jesus has already said in Matthew 19, 9, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another, commits adultery. The Christian shouldn't leave Christ because some heathen mate says it's either me or them. No, that's, I ought to stay with Christ. That doesn't mean that one has the right to remarry. That's not what's being taught in this context. Now, as we continue, we understand that Christian is under bondage to the Lord. That word is a slave or a bond servant. It is used 133 times and it, it doesn't relate to marriage relationship. It relates to my relationship to Christ. I am in servitude and I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ and I must stay true to Him. Marriages are bound by God's law until death separates them or scriptural divorce for the innocent party. Okay, well, we say, well, here's another question then. Paul will talk about uh, virgins and a man who's got betrothed wives and things like that. But then there's another one that we really want to address today, and that is, what about the widow? What is she to do? Let's say you've got a Christian couple that's married and one of them dies. Can a Christian widow remarry? She may have many years left on her uh, in her life. Can she remarry? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 39. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, if her husband dies, she's at liberty to marry to whomever she wishes only in the Lord. Well, what about when two Christians are married and one of them dies? Is it okay to remarry? Absolutely, friends. The Bible teaches that it's good to have a helpmate in this life. Uh, and that's scriptural and that's right, but are there some guidelines? Yes, there are. A Christian should always want to marry another Christian. And the Bible says we ought to remarry only in the Lord. Only marry a Christian, only marry according to God's laws on Christianity. Do what the Bible teaches and our marriages will be so much happier because we're striving to get to heaven and to help each other get there as well. Now, moving away from the idea of marriage, Paul is now going to address the subject of what about optional matters? And in the context, here's what we're talking about. There's some uh, in Corinth and in other places, uh, you can imagine the scenario with me. Let's say that they had idol worship and they took some big heifer, 2,000 pound heifer, down to the idol altar and they offered that have her on the altar and then once that was offered and that was over well they didn't need the meat for anything so they sold it to the local butcher shop and it's just meat but some people know that from the point of that altar to the meat being in the counter rack on the butcher shop uh, that that meat was down at the altar the idol worship earlier is it okay to go to that butcher shop and buy that meat and eat it well, Paul is going to address that idea, and, he going, and he's going to address dealing with optional matters. But before he addresses that, 
he needs to address some who are rather arrogant about this and not being considerate of others who may not understand. Notice 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 1. Paul says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. And so there were some who were saying, Hey, we've got this all figured out. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to worry about it. It's, it's no longer tainted. It's not tainted meat. It's just meat. It's just a slice of ham or a slice of beef, and it's nothing more. And others aren't sure of that yet. And they're saying, well, we don't care what you think. Paul's saying, hey, we've all got knowledge. Don't claim knowledge as your trump card here, okay? You need to be thinking about others and not do anything that would cause the weaker brother to stumble. And so knowledge just for knowledge's sake alone is not what the Christian needs. Knowledge without love is pride. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And knowledge without love or knowledge with love is edification. We think about, we're trying to lift one another up. It's not only just what we know, it's also who we know that might be involved in the situation. And so Paul writes to the church here and he tells them very clearly that they've got to consider the conscience of the weak and how that might affect them if they haven't got all this figured out in their own mind yet. Let me illustrate. Look in 1 Corinthians 8 and notice what Paul says in verses 7 through 9. He says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat it are, the be are we the better, nor if we don't eat it uh, are we the worse. But here's his recommendation. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. He says, we, we know that there's no such thing as an idol. And the meat that has been offered to an idol is not idolatrous meat. That can't be the case if idols don't even exist. But he says, I want you to think carefully about what you're doing, though. Consider how you deal with others on this. And, and as he clearly says in verse number 9, beware somehow lest this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to someone else. Um, food is a matter, Paul will say meat and food, it's a matter of indifference. That's not going to condemn you before God. But I want you to hear what Paul says very similar to this, and it's about the same issue, meat that's been offered to idols, in Romans 14, verse 23. He says this, He who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. What about the person who hadn't got it all figured out yet? What about the person who hasn't thought through that? What if he's not sure and he's thinking, well, you know, this might be wrong. To do that without looking to the Scripture and understanding that would be wrong. What about the person who's not sure if it's right and sees you doing it? Well, friend, I want to do what I can to help that person. I, I, I want to be very cautious of that. I want to try not to ever do anything to make anybody stumble. And so there is the teaching that we've got to be sensitive to. Uh, someone who may not be as mature, someone who may not have studied an issue, someone who may never thought about that. I need to be sensitive enough to other people's needs to consider them, encourage them, and try to work with them. But the problem in Corinth is you've got some conceited, proud people who just don't care what anybody else thinks. We're going to do it this way because it's right, and you can like it or lump it, and it doesn't matter how you feel about it. Paul says, no, that's not the way you do it. Look in 1 Corinthians 8, verse number 11. The Bible records this for us. And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Are you willing to send somebody to hell just so you can have your brisket sandwich? Now again, we're just using that as an illustration, but if somebody thought it were wrong and they weren't sure of that, and you doing that might be a stumbling block to them. And, and the, would you, just so you could do that, would, would you care less about their soul and do it anyway? Don't cause the weaker brother to stumble or be lost over a matter of liberty. Why? Paul says, I want you to hear this real well. 
you Corinthians who are doing this. You proud, puffed up Corinthians who are not thinking about how this might affect other people. I want you to know that if you go through with this, you're also sinning against Christ yourself. How is that? Look in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 12 and 13. The Word of God records this. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Well, Paul, what would you have us do? Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, if meat makes my brother stumble or food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now, was Paul planning on being a vegetarian the rest of his life? That's not the idea. And I think we'll all realize that. And Paul said, this is the extreme to which I'm talking about. I would never do it again if I thought somebody were going to go to hell over it, if it was going to make somebody stumble. And so the point here he's making is you've got to be considerate about other people. Now, if we talk to people, if we show them the Scriptures, if we study together, and they, you know, we can't force somebody to believe that, and once they've seen that, they've got to make their own decisions. And I can't go around living my life if they want to remain in ignorance. But at the same time, if somebody doesn't know, if somebody's unsure, somebody has a good and honest heart and they sincerely don't know and it, would, it might do them harm spiritually, the last thing you'd want to do is do that. Why? Because you've sinned against Christ and you've sinned against them and their weak conscience and, and that might be a stumbling block and cause them to fall away from the faith. And so Paul's answer is, if meat causes my brother to sin, take it off my diet. I'll never eat meat again. Your freedom in Christ, listen, my, our freedom in Christ is not more important than some brother's soul. Someone says, well, I can go do such and such because the Bible says I can, and I don't care if people don't understand it. My friend, I'm not talking about hard-hearted people who aren't gonna look in the Bible. But if there are good, sincere people who've got legitimate concerns and they've never learned or been taught about that, the I'm going to do it my way anyway attitude is not considerate of people's souls. Why is this, why is this whole meat issue a big deal anyway? Friend, it's not about the meat. I think that's what Paul says clearly. It's about souls. What's the most important thing? that any individual ever possesses. Mark 8, 36 and 37 says this, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing's more important than souls. If what I'm doing, if something I might do, even though I might have the liberty to do it, could make a brother stumble, might cause him to fall away and lose his soul, I'm going to think about my brother before I think about my belly and what I might like to do. And that's the advice that Paul gives to these Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, all of that being said about marriage, about optional matters, about being considerate of others, friend, the whole message that we see in 1 Corinthians thus far is the importance of letting God's will, God's way, and God's word direct our lives. Friend, we ask you to consider are you doing that? Are we really letting God and His plan direct our lives? We ask these questions for your consideration with us today. Number one, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? The Bible teaches the gospel must be obeyed. Matthew 7 verse 21, Jesus said, not everybody that just looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, is going there. But he who does the will of the Father in heaven. Uh, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Well, you say, obey the gospel. Let's ask another question then. What is the gospel? Friend, the gospel is good news. The good news is, in contrast to the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3, 23 and Romans 6, 23, there is a Savior. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 20, 21. He died on the cross so that people could go to heaven. And friend, that's good news to get excited about. Let's then ask another question. What must the individual then do to be saved? If I must obey the gospel, and the gospel is the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus... What do I need to do to be saved? And friend, I, I hope you're thinking about that question. 
with a good and sincere and honest heart. And I hope maybe you've got a pencil and a piece of paper at least and you'll write this down. The Bible teaches that to be saved, you've got to hear the message of salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. Having heard that message, the, the Scriptures teach you must believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior. Uh, John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed in Christ, are you willing to repent? In Luke chapter 13 verse 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you turn from a life of sin, change your way of thinking about sin, and change your way of acting by turning to God and do His will? Would you confess the Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, which you already believe? Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was our Lord who said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. Having made that good confession, would you do what the Bible teaches you must to have your sins washed away. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Here's what the scripture says. The very first gospel sermon. They cried out to Peter and the rest of the, the, the men there. Men and brethren what shall we do? Uh, his answer was so clear. Repent and be baptized. Why? Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? And then another question, if you have, are you living faithfully and are you planning on being faithful unto death? Jesus said, be faithful unto death, walk in newness of life. Revelation 2.10, Romans 6, verse number 4. And so friend, as we think about these questions today, our prayer and our hope is that these questions have been answered by you in the affirmative, in the scriptural way. If not, we'd love to help you with that. If we can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to contact us. And may each individual today who hears this message bring honor and glory to God through his life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.